Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh is a retired physician and also the founder of a national organization called Health Watch USA. Dr. K, good morning, sir. Uh, good morning, Jack. How are you? I'm doing pretty good today. Good. Well, it's uh, good to hear your voice. We missed you this week, and uh, we're glad to have you on with us. I guess we start with the oh. state here, and what does Kentucky, how do, how do we stand in terms of COVID vaccines? Well, as far as getting the vaccines out, we're on the lower end of the scale, 41st. And so the governor is gearing up hundreds of more vaccination sites, which I think is good. But one of the things that disturbs me is that in rural Kentucky, there is a lot of vaccine hesitancy. And I think this may be the problem with getting the vaccines out. As you know, once you get the vaccines, the ones that we currently have can't sit in a refrigerator they have to be given out fairly quickly. And so we do need to encourage people to get this vaccine and you need to get both doses because the second dose will allow you to have some immunity to the variants. And that's very important at this point. Uh, here's a question on our auto tech service text line. Right off the bat here, we're talking the vaccine. And here's a question. It says, please ask Dr. Kavanaugh, still hearing about older people dying or having strokes shortly after taking the vaccine, 68-year-old overweight diabetic wife, hard to convince it's safe. That's from John. What do you say to John to tell his wife? John, nothing is 100% safe, but believe me, the vaccine is much, much safer than getting COVID-19. If you look at deaths after the vaccination, there have been under 200, which isn't very many, when you consider they're giving this vaccine to very high-risk people, many of whom would have died anyways, and we have given out tens of millions of vaccine doses. We're over 40 million people have received the vaccine. I think we're close to 75 to 80 million doses that have been given out. And because of that, so many people who are high-risk have been given this vaccine. That number of patients dying is probably what would have occurred anyways, because these are high-risk patients. And the CDC has investigated these patients, and they have found no causal link between the vaccine and those deaths. So, yes, please get the vaccine. Well, yes, and I expect this product will be approved. It is also very effective at preventing deaths and hospitalizations. And, of course, that's the key thing. Johnson & Johnson product, you may have a more likelihood of getting a little bit of a cold-like symptoms with the virus as compared to the other vaccines, but the big advantage is it's just one dose and it does not have to be kept in extremely deep freeze and cold temperatures. So it has big advantages on reaching rural areas and getting people who are a little bit hesitant on getting a two-dose vaccine to get vaccinated. It does use almost the same technology in that it's delivering the DNA to the outside of the cell, inside the cytoplasm, and from there it makes the spike protein which the body reacts to. The difference is it's using a modified adenovirus capsule to deliver the vaccine as opposed to the PEG or this polyethylene glycol type of a capsule. And so if you've got a lot of allergies and you may be allergic to PEG, then maybe you should consider the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So I think it's exciting. We've got another vaccine in our armamentarium. Here's, ooh, I like that word. Uh, here's another yeah. text from our auto tech service text line. If a person has had COVID, do they need to get the vaccine shots? Don't they have antibodies in their own system? Well, you still should get the vaccine. You'll need to talk to your doctor about what the current advice is on the timing at one point, it was waiting at least three months. But yes, you still need to get the vaccine because the vaccine will give you a better immunological response and it will be a response also after the second dose that will help you fight off the variants. So here's the thing with normal immunity. Normal immunity will produce both binding and neutralizing antibodies. Binding antibodies don't do much. They maybe go to the surface of the capsule, don't kill the virus. So half of your immunological response in your body, you can kind of view as not being very effective. If you look at severity of illness versus immunological response, here you've got some real problems. Because if you have only a mild infection or asymptomatic infection, 
you're probably not going to have a very long-lasting response to this coronavirus. If you have a severe infection, then you may well have a response that gives you one or two years of immunity. But on the other hand, you've got a high likelihood of having lasting health effects too. And finally, remember, with the vaccine, if you get two doses, that's like getting the infection twice as far as boosting your immunity so that you've got a double hit there. So all of that together makes the vaccine a much safer and much more efficient way to get immunity to this virus. And with the vaccine, you're only eliciting or making neutralizing antibodies. So in other words, it's highly efficient at eliciting the immune response that will kill the virus. So yes, get the vaccination. All right, what's troubling a lot of folks, and rightfully so, these variants that seem to be popping up. We heard about the UK and then the South African, then the Brazilian. Now there's the New York and then came the California. Talk about those variants, if you will, and the possibility of being protected with the current vaccines from those variants. Well, the current vaccines, at least in the lab, look like they will be protective against the New York, the Brazilian, and the South African variants. There's actually another variant popped up in Japan. They all seem to have this E484K mutation as a way of avoiding. And as we've discussed previously on this show, that you may tend to group all those viruses together and say, well, they're kind of the same. Probably the solution that we come up to to kill those viruses will kill all of them at the same time. The California variant, I'm not totally sure of, but I would also expect that there would be a lot of cross-reactivity between the vaccine and that variant. That variant, as you know, has been highly infectious. It's also had increase in fatality, sometimes uh, up to 11 times more fatality rate in California. And the data is still out on that variant. But the good news is, is that the rate of infections in California is now down 83%, so that you are seeing the system come back into line. I should add that California's healthcare system was completely overrun by this new variant, and they were actually triaging patients. So some of the increase in death rate certainly could be due to not having good access to health care. And that's the other problem that, of course, we've discussed on this show with this infection. It's not just that it may cause a fatality directly by infecting the patient, but if it starts inhibiting people's access to health care, fatality rates will rise. So the good news is these vaccines should also help and keep you out of the hospital, keep you from dying with the new variants, but you need to get the vaccines and you need to get that second dose. Another auto tech service text. Our parents have been fully vaccinated. We have not yet. Is it safe to visit them? Probably not at this point. Right now, the advisements are to still wear masks and to be very cautious. It's, of course, would be safer. But until both people are vaccinated, I'm not hearing many public health officials advocating for people to co-mingle. And I need to tell you, there's no data on that. It's just kind of common sense that if both are vaccinated, it will then be safe. However, I need to tell you, Jack, that with these variants, who knows? I mean, that's the thing. We're applying old information and science to these new variants, hoping that it will be the same. In all probability, it would be. All right. Uh, in case you just tuned in, Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh is our guest. We have a bunch of texts from our auto tech service text line. Are there any medicine allergies that should make you hesitant to take the vaccine? None that I know of, except if you have a specific allergy to PEG, which is P-E-G, and that's a component in some of the formulations of the medicine. So it's kind of like you're not allergic to the medicine itself, but what it's mixed in with or how it's being delivered. And so that's something you're going to have to ask your doctor about. But again, that's a very rare allergy. That occurs in approximately 4.7 people per million who get the vaccine if it's a Pfizer BioNTech product, and about half that if it's a Moderna product. Those allergies usually occur within the first 15 minutes, and although they can become quite severe, no one has died of them. They're treatable, and to date, believe me, I would not worry about that as much as getting COVID-19. But again, you need to ask your doctor about that. 
Dallas has a question. My wife is scheduled for her first vaccine on Tuesday and then an outpatient procedure involving IV sedation on Wednesday, injection and infusion. Your thoughts? Um, probably not a good idea because you can react to the vaccine. In other words, it can give you a temperature, it can give you a headache. And my thoughts are that, well, maybe if that occurred, you'd be wondering if on the procedure, if you actually was having, for example, an infection because you were having a fever, but that was caused by the vaccine. I think that that just is a little bit too complicated. And I would probably let your surgeon know about that and make sure it is okay, or at least so they're aware of what might be taking place. Uh, one more here. Uh, when I read about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it said the difference between this one and the other two is that uh, this one's uh, you, this one uses DNA technology versus MMA technology. Could you explain what the difference is between those? Well, Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines deliver the same mRNA type of a product, and that encodes the spike protein. So that's delivered into the cellular cytoplasm the mRNA, and it's not very stable, it doesn't hang around for a long time, but it then codes for production of the spike protein in the cellular machinery. Now, DNA, which is in the Johnson & Johnson and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, when that's delivered into the cell, the DNA will make the mRNA, which will then make the spike protein. So it's actually an additional step. The advantage of the DNA is, is that it's much more stable. And those vaccines can be kept, for example, in a refrigerator. And so it has a lot of advantages. All of these vaccines, when they deliver the product into the cytoplasm, they completely bypass the cellular nucleus and the cellular DNA. So it doesn't affect that. Plus, none of these particles can reproduce themselves. So anything that's going on is just going on in your arm. It's not going on throughout your whole body. And this is one of the reasons why they do not affect PCR or antigen tests. Vaccination can affect some of the antibody tests. But as far as PCR and antigen, they do not affect those. Got 30 seconds left to wrap us up. Well, it's very important right now to follow public health advice. What we have now is a race between our pharmaceutical industry and making vaccines versus the variants. We want to slow down the spread of the virus so the vaccines can catch up and we can snuff out the virus. So right now we're looking at a booster to wipe out the South African virus. What we don't want to have is another variant that we need to have a fourth shot to get. So please follow public health device and control spread. Thank you, Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh. Have a great weekend. Thank you, sir.